Thank you, guys. You can have a seat. Thank you, Cesar, for reading our word. It's so good to see you this morning. Give me just a second. Our, our podium's piled up here like our dining room table tends to get at home a little bit. You know, you've got to clean it off sometimes. So if you have your copy of God's Word, go ahead and turn over to Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. That's the text that our brother read for us. And as you're turning there, let me just say welcome to you. It's a, it's a good morning. We're gathered together. Many of us are traveling, but we're so thankful that you're here with us. And not only do we get the feast on the Word today, there's a literal feast out there being prepared. When I came in, I saw some little turkeys made of Oreos and Rice Krispie treats, okay? So that's what's waiting on us outside. As a reminder, this is the core team phase of our church plant, and I can't help but think someday we're all going to look back with a lot of fondness for these days to reflect on all that God did in and through this step of faith we took together. And so we're just so grateful for you, and we're thankful that you're joining us in this journey to plant this brand new congregation. And so we're in the midst of our very first sermon series that we're calling Gospel Partnership. And in this series, we're doing the best we can in this core team phase to build a good gospel foundation. So in this series, though it may seem like we're beating a dead horse, I don't know how that translates to other cultures, we're being repetitive, uh, we're just doing the best we can to, over and above, articulate our vision, our mission, and our core values so we can have a firm foundation. And so before moving to the core values, this week and next, we want to focus on the two rhythms of Radiant City. We desire to be a gathered, that's number one, and then a scattered congregation. Gathered and scattered. Far too often, especially in the American church context, we think of the church in terms of a place that provides religious goods and services and not a people with a purpose. And that has to change. In fact, one thing I love about where Radiant City gathers is that we're not in a church building. And it, it is a visible teaching element every time we enter in that no church is not a place that we check into. It's a people. You're the church. You make up the church. And so we want to be a gathered and a scattered church of people that come and worship God and then scatter and live on mission. So today... I'll focus this on the gathered church, and then next week, Pastor Cliff will focus on the scattered church. This morning, let me begin by asking a question. Have you ever had to go to a meeting that you dreaded going to? And most people hate meetings, and the, stint, the, the dread stems from the fact that it seems many times that meetings can be pointless, and they can be a little bit boring. Uh, not long ago, we drove through our neighborhood, and there was a sign up that said, HOA meeting this Friday. And I said, hey, Brittany, do you want to go to that? And she said, that sounds horrible. And I, I agreed wholeheartedly, it did sound horrible. But at times, if meetings carry significant purposes, we might be more motivated to attend. For example, if your HOA is discussing a big brand new fitness and recreation center, you might be motivated to go there as opposed to talking about acceptable paint colors for your house, okay? If your place of employment is meeting to discuss the details of a big, of a big merger, you might be more prone to go to those meetings. Now, regarding local church gatherings, to be honest, many people in culture they would rather go to the dentist. After a late Saturday night, you have to get up early. You actually have to put on pants and go somewhere. I mean, people dread sometimes going to church on Sunday mornings. And this stems from the fact that many people have had bad experiences with the church. They view it as an institution where somebody like me gets up and gives a long, guilt-inducing speech about how you've missed the mark in so many ways, but yet they never quite point you to the one who met the mark for you, namely Jesus Christ. 
And so my hope this morning is to highlight from Hebrews 10, 19 through 25, that every single meeting of a local church carries significant uh, impact. It carries significance. It, it carries a significant purpose. I mean, what we're doing today is infinitely more valuable than any HOA meeting you could ever attend. So as we soak in these truths regarding the significance of a church gathered, I'm praying that God would press into our hearts, press into Radiant City's heart, that we should always prioritize coming together with our faith family. It won't always be this way. Sometimes Sunday morning attendance is a discipline, but I really hope that the prayer of our hearts will primarily be church is something I get to gather with and not something I have to go to. Amen? So in the passages and chapters immediately preceding today's verses, the author of Hebrews, he's trying to espouse just what a great, exalted, high priest that Jesus is. He's calling us to look into the priesthood of Jesus. And he's arguing that Jesus is a better priest. He's the mediator of a better covenant, the new covenant. And Jesus is a better sacrifice. When he gave himself on the cross to die for your sins, he was infinitely greater in that moment than any animal sacrifice. Because his sacrifice atoned for sins once and for all. No more bulls need to have their necks slit anymore because Christ was crucified on the cross. Now, in view of Christ's great priesthood, the author of Hebrews is going to tell us how we should live in light of his priestly work. And in short, here's how we should live. We should draw near, we should hold fast, and we should help each other. Draw near hold fast, and help one another. Number one, draw near to God with confidence. If you're taking notes, that's number one. And this comes from verses 19 through 22. Let me read it again. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So in, in light of the great priestly work of Jesus, verse 19 is telling us that we now have confidence to enter the holy places. And so this points us back to the Old Testament. And if you'll remember, in the temple, the inter sanctum of the temple was a place called the Holy of Holies. And that's the very place that God's presence dwelt. And listen to what Hebrews 9, 7 says about the Holy of Holies. But into the second, that's the second room, the Holy of Holies, only the high priest goes. And he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. So here's my question. If a well-prepared high priest could only go into the Holy of Holies one time a year, then what kind of hope, what on earth are we doing thinking that we have confidence to draw in Anytime we want to. Well, the great news of the gospel is this. Your entrance into God's presence, it's not based on your perfections. It's not based on your merit. It's not based on your good work. Rather, it's based on Christ's perfect work on your behalf. That's the way we get to go in. Verses 19 and 20 tell us it was by the blood of Jesus. He was the once and for all sacrifice for our sins and as his body was torn on the cross the temple curtain was torn symbolizing that we can walk in again think back to the Old Testament in that temple hung a massive curtain that was impenetrable 
to light. It guarded people from God's presence and in a way that only God could have done it. When Christ died, that thick curtain was torn in half. It's glorious news. It means people like you and I can enter in boldly. We can draw near to God with great confidence. That severed relationship that sin caused has now been restored in Jesus. Now, notice verse 21. I I love this. This really came alive in my heart this week when I studied this. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, Radiant City, that text does not say since we had a great priest. It says since we have a great priest. Not only did Jesus die past tense for our sins, but he resurrected in power. And now he is reigning at the right hand of the Father in heaven. See, all the other supposed priests, right now they will die. And all the other priests throughout history, they are dead. But our priest, the better priest, Jesus, he's alive and he's reigning. And what this means for you, in a way that supersedes any pastor's faithfulness, even though we want to be there for you, it means that the priest known as Jesus, he's perpetually available to you. Anytime you've got a need, anytime you've got a burden, you can boldly go into his presence. He always has willing and listening ears. It means he is perfectly trustworthy. In an age where pastors have fallen to sin, and we read about these scandals of supposed priests, it means that the priest named Jesus, he will only operate with you and minister to you with a perfectly pure heart. I mean, you can take to the bank that Jesus will never let you down. He will love you perfectly. He will never be abusive to you. And he continually intercedes on your behalf to the Heavenly Father. I mean, we're happy to pray for you. We take prayer seriously. Your future city group, we want them to to labor in prayer for you. But how much more encouraging is it to know that King Jesus... He never stops interceding for you and I. And so that great high priesthood of Jesus, when we understand it in its fullness, it should motivate all of us to want to draw near to God with a greater boldness. But there is a prerequisite before we can draw near. Look at verse 22. The author of Hebrews says, Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. To summarize, what the author is saying is that we must draw near with believing and cleansed hearts. The only way we can approach God is by faith, having had our hearts cleansed by the work of Jesus. See, again, in our world, some people mistakenly think that they can get back in God's presence through their own merits. They believe they can counterset, they can offset, counterbalance the great sins they've committed if they can just go above and beyond with their good works. But the problem is, no amount of good works we could ever do could cancel out our sin debt. The Bible says we are sinners by choice, but we're also sinners by nature. Our hearts are tainted and stained with the stain of sin. So the only hope we have is not in our power, not in our moral ability, but the only hope we have is in the perfections of Jesus and His atoning work on our behalf. And when we trust in Him, the Spirit of God comes in, And he does a deep and cleansing work in our hearts. I'll never forget when I trusted Jesus as a 10-year-old. I didn't know a lot about the faith. I didn't know a lot about the decision that I had made. But the pastor asked me, son, how do you feel? And I said, I feel clean. It felt like God had cleansed my heart from the inside out. I felt like I had a clean conscience. 
And when we get baptized, that is symbolic of what happened in your heart when you trusted in Jesus. He plunged you. He washed you white as snow. So friends, when it comes to entering into the presence of God, hear me, it's not about what you do. It's about who you know and what He did on your behalf. Think about it this way. It is so interesting to me, this word confidence can also be translated as authorized. Because of Jesus, we have now been authorized to enter the presence of God. I don't know if you've ever been in a place where you felt awkward or fearful that you were suddenly somewhere you weren't authorized to be. And this has happened for me a couple of times as I have made pastoral hospital visits. So the hundreds of times I've been in the hospital, on occasion, I will accidentally get on the staff-only elevator, okay? I've done it twice, and one time the doctors actually kicked me off and sent me to the peasant's elevator, you know, next door. And then another occasion, I got on, and I was the only one without scrubs on, and they kind of gave me the evil eye the whole way up. So fast forward a few years later, I remember when my son Knox was born. It was an emergency C-section, and something so unique about both our boys is that I, I was the first one to hold them both because my wife has been knocked out both times, okay? And so I had that privilege. Well, as Brittany's knocked out, as I'm behind the nurse and as we're wheeling my baby up to NICU, she gets on the staff elevator. And I instinctively stepped off and said, I, I can't go there. I've been rebuked before. But she said, no, honey, jump on this elevator. Get in here with your son and let's get this boy to NICU. See, I was able to enter into a restricted area because of my son. And so Radiant City, our sins restrict us from entering into God's presence. But praise be to Jesus, because of the gospel, we are authorized to enter in because of the Son of God and the great work He did on our behalf. And so, friends, I want us to be a church that passionately pursues the presence of God together. I want us to see this command to draw in as an open invitation Let's lock arms and go near continually to the throne of grace for whatever needs we have. This is why worship gatherings are so crucial. Through the word ministered on the platform, through the informal ministry of the word in the seats as we have conversation, we remind one another to not run away from God, but to go to Him again and again when trials and tribulations come our way. He's our refuge. Run to Him. Don't run away from Him. And then when we sin as believers, there's a proclivity to not want to face God, to go away from our Heavenly Father, to do what Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden when they hid from God. And so there are so many times, me included, when I need the reminders from my church family, wait a minute, God is not a disappointed and distant dad. He's your loving Heavenly Father, and He wants you to run to Him when you fail. His arms always stand open, anxious to forgive you and cleanse you if you'll repent before Him. So Radiant City, especially when we gather together, let's be a church that draws near to God with confidence. Number two, in view of Christ's great priesthood, we should hold fast to the confession of our faith. Hold fast to the confession of our faith. Look at verse 23 again. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So, first of all, notice this is a corporate command. It says, let us hold fast. Let's do this together. We're to hang on tightly to this together. Well, what are we holding on to? It says the confession of our hope. And so the confession of faith simply refers to the teaching of Christ, the proclamation of the gospel, the glorious truths of Scripture that we believe to be infallible, inspired. That's what we're hanging on to. 
And I love that the author of Hebrews says it's a confession of our hope. It means that doctrine, our confession, is life-giving, not depleting. See, a lot of people, when they think of doctrine and teaching, they think of boring. They think of drudgery. They think of an HOA meeting, okay? But he's trying to say, no, no, wait a minute. The truths we have in Scripture, they're precious. They fill our cells with the hope of Jesus. They're life-giving. They're not depleting. They give us encouragement. They give us resolve to press on. Now, notice it says we're to hold on without wavering. Now, we could say a lot about that, but what that term is pointing us to is persevering in the faith. It's pressing on and not giving up. It's making it until the end. As so many of our senior ladies say, I'm all in until it's all over. That's what it's pointing to. Now, the reason we need that pointer, though, is that Christianity is a hard race to run. I mean, think about your own life. Think about friends and family members that at one time were faithful Christians. And unfortunately, many of the people that we could say that about, now they're on the sidelines looking on. And this is because there is great cost involved in being a disciple. It's worth it, but it's costly. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 14, But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. And so, yes, the journey of following Jesus, it is absolutely worth it. Again, talk to a senior saint who's been on the journey for decades, and they will tell you that. But let me warn you, it will be very difficult to hang on at times. Temptations will come your way, and they will threaten to entice to get you off the narrow pathway. Many of us have gone through or will go through intense seasons of suffering. And during those times, you'll wonder if God's really good. Is all of this really worth it? We, therefore, all need each other the help of the church to hang on to this confession of faith. Listen, you won't make it on your own. God did not design the Christian life to be lived in isolation. You need the help of your faith family to hold on to this confession. You know, if you think about it, there are certain tasks in life that are nearly impossible to do alone. I mean, I can't tell you how many marriages have been tried and how much sanctifications happen when you try to put up a beach canopy together when the wind's blowing, okay? I mean, can't do that by yourself. For me, I have determined it is impossible to fold and to put a fitted sheet on the mattress alone. I mean, I can't do it. My faith is tested every time. So there are certain tasks in life where you need some other hands to hold it down, to help you to hang on. And so hear me plain and straight, for your faith, the sake of your faith, making it until the end, you need many other hands to help you hold it down. You know, just for example, when we come together as a gathered church, and we hear the word taught, we're reminded that, man, the word of God has marvelous internal consistencies. And it's grounded in historical realities, and it strengthens your faith. When we gather together and our souls are weary, how often as you've lifted high the name of Jesus and have kind of gotten lost in the gospel, has your own soul been lifted up? When we come together and serve each other through encouraging words and works, it helps to lift up the burdens that threaten to bog us down on our journey to heaven. And when we gather together, and by God's grace, we see salvations, and we see baptisms, and we see people cross over from death to life, we're reminded that, wait a minute, lives can be changed because of Jesus. And everything we're doing, from the step of faith we took, to our financial stewardship, to all the sermons we prepare, to all the food we're serving, to all the kids we're loving, it is all worth it. We need that reminder. We need to remind one another of Christ, of whom verse 23 says is faithful to keep his promises. 
And when we remind one another to look to him, to his faithfulness, it helps us to carry on in the faith when we're tempted to give up. Now, we certainly have a role to play in our perseverance, do we not? I mean, the Bible tells us that we have to walk in faith. We must repent of our sins. In our power, we must cling to Christ again and again and again. But understand, you could never persevere in your own strength and in your own power. You can't do that alone. As the old hymn says, and this hymn strikes me so deep every time we sing it, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. That's that remaining sin nature in you that wants to drift. It's like when I'm driving late at night and, and my wife's car has that lane assist. Right, I want to get off track and it beeps and tells me to get back in the lane. We need the Spirit of God to bring us back. And the promise we have is that He will bring us back. Our perseverance, our making it to the end, is not ultimately about our faithfulness. It's about the faithfulness of Jesus. Him hanging on to us until the very end. Look at verse 23 again. It says, Let us, we have our part, hold fast together to the confession of our hope without wavering. But then notice what it says. For he who promises faithful, it's because of his faithfulness, his grip on us, that will make it until the end. So here's another way to think about it, and I apologize. So many of my illustrations are rooted in my family. I don't do a whole lot except hang out with my family right now, okay? Preach and be a parent. That's my life right now. But my oldest son, Knox, the reason he's probably not in here is he'll be doing laps around the room. He's two. And he's crazy, and he's got unceasing energy. He loves to run. He loves to be chased around the yard. And so I'm having to teach him that, hey, see that place where cars go? Don't go in the street. You know, don't get into dangerous places. And I'm training him, like when we go into a store, to reach his hand up so I can grab it. Now, if you think about it, if you're a parent or been a parent, when you're holding your child by the hand and walking them in the store... Their security lies not in their grip. It lies in your grip. Because so many times, Knox tries to bolt and go this direction. He'll see a buggy or a car, or he may see Aunt Juju over at the shoe store, and he wants to go see her. And that's Juliana Oliveira, by the way, if you don't know who Juju is. And I have to grab him by the wrist and pull him back in. It is my stronger grip on his hand that keeps him on course. And friends, I think this is the way it works with God. Yes, we have to get in the habit of repenting, of continually reaching for the Father's hand. We want to obediently go where God is taking us. But the reason that we'll make it to the end, it's not about the strength of your hand. It is about the sovereign grip of His. He's the one that leads us the pathway of perseverance. So Radiant City, let's be a church that helps each other stay true to the confession of faith. Let's remind each other through the word of God spoken formally and informally again and again that we have a strong and secure love in Jesus. As we move into verses 24 and 25, here's the third way that we're called to live in light of Christ's great priesthood, number three, encourage one another toward love and good works. In light of his priestly work, encourage each other toward love and good works. Look at verse 24. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. While it's okay to encourage each other off the cuff in spontaneous ways, this phrase, let us consider, means that we should give a serious and planned out even consideration of how to encourage one another. It means this should be on our radar, radar 
constantly that we should be planning and scheming about how we should encourage each other in the work of Christ. You know, you guys have asked me about my hiking trips that I take, and that's one of my favorite hobbies. I take these long hiking trips in the mountains and sleep out with the bears. I mean, I know some of y'all are terrified by that, that have only lived in South Florida, but you've got even scarier things here, gators and snakes. I mean, it's just a bear. But when I'm going on one of these trips, man, I am preparing a detailed plan. Brittany can tell you, I'm like a mad scientist in a lab. I'm thinking about my itinerary, my food, my shoes, how far I'll travel. I mean, there's so much thought that goes into executing a hike on the Appalachian Trail. Well, it hit me like a ton of bricks this week that I should be putting the same amount of thoughtfulness into my planning when it comes to encouraging my brothers and sisters in Christ. Can I just give one small example? And they would never want me to mention this from the platform, but in passing, a few Wednesday nights ago, I joked that my wife and I's favorite fatty, sugary treats are Chips Ahoy cookies and Lucky Charms, okay? I mean, I'm a grown man, but I confess, I I love those magical charms with marshmallows, okay? I I love them. And the next day, lo and behold, we get a delivery Five boxes of family-sized Lucky Charms and Chips Ahoy cookies. And we said, where did these come from? From the Lord? They said, no, from Sal Delfino, okay? And so that was very thoughtful encouragement to my family. Now, he may send me into early-onset diabetes, I don't know, but that was encouraging us because it was thoughtful. And that's how we should encourage one another. I love the word here translated stir up. In verse 24, this is a very strong word. It's used in a strong way in the New Testament. In fact, when Paul and Barnabas had their big blow up, their fight, in Acts 15, this word is used to talk about their conflict. And so we've all been stirred up in bad ways when somebody pulls out in front of you in traffic or You find that somebody's been talking about you behind your back? I mean, you can feel that anger rise up in your heart. It's being stirred. Well, here the author of Hebrews, he's using the word in a positive way. He's saying that we should give so much attention, so much thoughtfulness to encouragement, that it causes love to be stirred up into the hearts of the brethren. And the hope is that as love is stirred up, It will overflow into kingdom work. See, the reality is we all get faint-hearted at times, even your leaders. And sometimes a box of Lucky Charms goes a long way. And so we need to encourage one another. We all wonder whether or not we're doing a good job. Many of us have this internal record of bad self-talk that always is on repeat and it says things like you're not good enough or smart enough. And this is why we all need to get into the habit of receiving the gospel spoken into us and speaking it into the lives of others. You know, young mothers that are raising kids and are tempted to pull their hair out need to be reminded that it's worth it. You're making disciples at home and that you're probably doing a lot better than you think you are. And that even when you fail as a parent, there is so much grace and forgiveness you to keep on keeping on in the home when young athletes don't perform well on the field like cliff playing soccer when all his dad could say was good job running up and down the field you know (laughs) athletes need to hear that your identity is not bound up in your performance your identity secure in jesus in our culture We have a bad tendency to only open our mouths when we're upset, when we want to levy a complaint, when the service is bad at the restaurant. As Christians, how much more should we open our mouths to speak life, to speak hope, to speak encouraging words, to lift up the faint-hearted, and to even celebrate the ways we see people serving Jesus in excellence? And then in verse 25 we get the very best context for encouragement. 
It says, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. And so Radiant City understand that the very best context for encouragement is face-to-face interactions. And we have to keep this in mind during a pandemic. Now, out of love for neighbor, out of necessity, churches have had to make challenging decisions to delay services, to go to virtual-only models. And we still have many people, even in this flock right now, staying home and tuning in from afar out of an abundance of caution. We understand that. And we're grateful that we can stay connected through social media and live streaming. But based on verse 25, we have to understand that all of that will always be second best. God designed his people to routinely, to frequently get together in person. And this is why pastors are so slow to cancel gatherings, because it's so challenging at times to square this command with the pandemic that we're living in. So all this is is a plea to pray for leaders and pastors, to be faithful to the word, but to be smart and to love our neighbors well. But with everything equal, when things are back to normal, whenever that is, maybe after the vaccine, here are the two primary reasons that we should not neglect assembling. Number one, listen to this. To neglect the church is to neglect Christ. Think about that. To neglect the church is to neglect Jesus. I can't tell you how many good old boys back home say things like this. Well, pastor, me and Jesus, we've got our own thing going. I don't need the church family. My sanctuary is the woods. My sanctuary is the lake. But the Bible teaches that God's people are united to Christ. And Christ so closely relates to his people, the church, that you can't separate him from a local church. You can't parse him out. Remember Acts chapter 9, when Saul was on the road of Damascus, on his way to terrorize Christians... He has an encounter with the risen Lord. And here's what the Lord says in verses 4 and 5. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You see what I'm getting at here? To persecute God's people is to persecute God. And he said, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. This is how closely... Christ relates to his people. That to persecute his followers is to persecute Jesus. Therefore, to neglect the church is to neglect Christ. You can't worship God rightly. You'll never do that alone unless you come together routinely with a church family. It's okay to worship God alone. We're after way of life worship, but it can't just be alone. You've got to come together with God's people. Number two, we should not forsake assembling because to neglect the church is to neglect your soul. Your soul will shrivel. How many of us in the pandemic, especially when we were virtually only, you could feel your soul shriveling. There's there's lonesomeness, loneliness. We shouldn't neglect our souls. Understand that we were all created for a community We all need relationships, even introverts. God designed all of us to be interdependent on one another. That inner wellspring of your life, your soul, it will never flourish a part of Christian community. You know, in many arenas of life, we know that we'll pay the price if we neglect certain things. If you don't work out, your heart won't be healthy and strong. If you don't go to the dentist, you'll have lots of cavities, okay, over time. If you don't brush your teeth, you'll get cavities. If you don't study, you'll flunk out of school. If you don't practice, you won't get played by your coach. You won't excel in the athletic arena. In life, we are in the habit of giving ourselves to discipline 
when it comes to so many rhythms of life. But many believers neglect perhaps the greatest discipline we could give ourselves to, the gathering of the local church. And understand when we neglect it, we do it to our soul's detriment. Well, as we conclude this passage, let's look at the final words in verse 25, the second half of verse 25. And I hope this leaves us with a ring of urgency as it relates to gathering with our faith family, as it relates to encouraging one another. It says, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And all the more as you anticipate the return of Jesus. Have you ever thrown a surprise party for somebody? You know, not long ago, some of the ladies threw one for Kyle. He graduated the police academy, and I missed it, man. I was out of town. But I heard it was good, and uh, they worked so hard. They had balloons together. A cake was put into place. And when you're throwing a surprise party for somebody, a sense of urgency gets in your bones the closer it comes to time for them to get home. But if you think about it, as you're acting in urgency, man, get the balloons ready, get the cake ready, make sure it's prepared, you're not operating out of a sense of dread or duty. You're operating out of delight because you can't wait to see their face. You can't wait to see the joy that strikes them when they walk through that door. So Radiant City, verse 25b, adds a similar yet greater urgency when it comes to the need to draw together, all the more as we anticipate the coming of Jesus. And as we anticipate Christ's coming, we don't gather out of drudgery or duty, we gather out of delight and joy. It's our joy and honor to gather and to worship the one who saved us from our sins. And we don't dread him coming back because when we see him, it won't be wrath. If you're in Christ, it'll be love. It'll be delight. You'll get to see his face smile as he hopefully says to us, Well done, my good and faithful servants. And friends, I believe, based on what we're seeing in today's world, that he's coming back sooner than later. We're at least a day closer to it today than we were yesterday. So friends, in the meantime... In the most difficult of years, maybe the hardest year we've ever been through, let's not neglect one another. Let's not let politics and preferences drive us apart, but let's keep coming together. And let's do it again and again and again every Sunday until God calls us home, until Jesus comes back. Radiant City, may we always prioritize gathering as a local church. Let's stand and Pray together. Father, we thank you for your word, and we are grateful for this command. Uh, but God, when we see your commands in Scripture, help us to always see it's for our benefit, for our good, and not for our dread. And God, I know a lot of people have been involved in churches and religious expressions where it just seems so ritualistic. It's not all that fun to come together. It's not something we look forward to. But oh God, based on this word, may you help us to delight to come together. May it be something we anticipate all week long, gathering together with your people to worship you. So this morning, God, I pray that we would leave with just a greater appreciation of the gathered church. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, hey, friends, one thing we get to do.